Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be listening to me. I'm Dr. Uh, Musuba Adetunji Babatunde. Uh, today, I'm your, your course director, and today we shall be discussing institutional arrangements with respect to domestic uh, resource mobilization. We've tried to look at the introductory aspect of domestic resource mobilization. We've tried to identify the sources and the potentials of the domestic resources available in Africa in Module 2. Uh, Module 3, I've tried to look at the constraints uh, that affect domestic resource mobilization. Now, this particular Module 4 is trying to look at uh, the institutional arrangements uh, that is actually put in, that have been put in place in order to, to mobilize uh, enough domestic resources in Africa. And as a way of introduction, we all know that strong and efficient institutions are necessary to scale up domestic resource mobilization in Africa. We need this institutional capacity in order to ensure that optimal policies are used to perform the tasks designed and implementation is as complete as necessary. Some of the countries have not performed well with respect to domestic resource mobilization in Africa due to weak institutions, because these institutions are the one that will coordinate uh, the effectiveness or design the strategies that will be used to mobilize domestic resources. And there are quite many. For example, the central banks has a role to play. And the mandates of central banks is basically looking at uh, the three components of price stability, financial stability, as well as supporting economic uh, development objective of, uh, of the government. So, in most cases, the type of monetary policy that government uh, actually puts in place, we go a long way in order to mobilize uh, domestic resources in the African, uh, uh, African continent. And as much as possible, the funds that uh, uh, central bank mobilize are then used as intervention funds uh, for particular sector. So the regulatory activities of the central bank is very, very fundamental in order to make sure that uh, effective resources are, are actually mobilized. Then you have the deposit money banks uh, in the context of mobilizing uh, domestic resources uh, in, uh, in Africa. These deposit money banks are quite fundamental. Their role are quite fundamental to are mobilizing the domestic resources because they mobilize resources from the surplus aspect of the economy and channel it to the deficit aspect of the uh, of the uh, of the economy. So, but you know, sometimes ago that we have the uh, global financial crisis that actually affected uh, affected their uh, ability. But these days, you discovered that uh, most deposit money banks in Africa are uh, more into distributive trade, in fact, to actually. Uh, grants more money to the uh, distributive uh, uh, street uh, sector. And, but whatever the little amount of money that can actually be taken in terms of the financial intermediary, we go a long way into uh, getting funds, accumulated funds for uh, investment and transformation of the uh, African economy. Although there are challenges that uh, these deposit money banks have been complaining about with respect to some of these firms uh, uh, getting funds and then making use of them effectively, uh, because some of them have been accused of poor managerial ability that most firms that come forward to borrow money lack poor, uh, uh, doesn't have good managerial ability, they don't have ability to repay, the inner risk and insufficient uh, collateral. So, that has actually put more uh, emphasis. Uh, the deposit money banks have put more emphasis on collateral uh, instead of uh, putting uh, more activities into the technical aspect of screening of uh, banks and assisting businesses, which is what I call the lazy bank uh, hypothesis. And also, development finance institutions also have a role to play with respect to mobilizing domestic resources. The capital market. An efficient capital market will definitely go a long way in terms of uh, uh, getting things done with respect to mobilizing uh, 
domestic resources uh, in uh, in Africa because as financial market they have a very big role to play in mobilization of resources for long term investment through financial uh, intermediation the existence of money and capital markets facilitate trading in short and long term debt instruments to make short and long term needs of large users of funds such as governments banks and uh, similar uh, institutions so a capital market also helps to strengthen corporate financial structure and improve the general solvency of the financial uh, financial system so the role of capital markets in mobilizing domestic resources is also very fundamental uh, in the continent and the pension funds as well in terms of what they do also um take into consideration that this is also another uh, opportunity of mobilizing uh, domestic resources because the african pension funds offers an enormous promise as a continental source of investment capital to the people it's over it's estimated at about 29 billion dollar and can actually play a role in the regional structural uh, uh, transformation then you also have the african infrastructure development fund also as an institution that can actually be used other set of uh, uh, ways of through which you can also mobilize domestic resources in Africa. You have the private equity bonds, you have the infrastructure bonds, you have the diaspora bonds, the sovereign wealth bonds, the revenue collection agencies in Africa. This is another particular rule, another institutional framework that uh, we also need to focus on in terms of uh, getting uh, uh, getting uh, uh, things done. You know, you have the tax authority, you have the internal revenue service, you have the customs that have a critical role to play in mobilizing domestic resources in Africa. But there are accusations that the revenue, especially tax collection, has been quite poor in Africa because of very expensive and inefficient tax collection system. Most African countries still try to collect their taxes uh, using pen and paper instead of using automation in terms of generating it. Then you have corrupt uh, uh, practice of uh, tax officials as well uh, with capacity of the uh, revenue uh, officials. And some of them are not even IT compliant. They lack basic knowledge of information technology and does not have the requisite qualification to, to work in the agency. So most multinational corporations now try to hide in terms of uh, uh, collecting, uh, paying the appropriate revenue because they know that uh, they can actually get around it, given the challenges that uh, uh, of software of some other capacity that uh, some of the uh, staff officials actually like. So there's a need to improve the capacity of uh, revenue collection agents in order to make their role as, a, in, as an institution to function uh, uh, effectively. And also there's a need to also deploy ICT uh, that enables the integration of uh, uh, the collection of taxes uh, in the uh, in the continent, then you also have non-bank financial institutions that are also serving as a very big role in terms of uh, uh, generating uh, generating uh, revenue collection of revenue uh, in the continent, and their role is also very very critical. And you know you, you have the insurance uh, and also other non-bank uh, financial institutions. So this this uh, very great institution that can mobilize us and also channel it to uh, the transformation of the African continent. But the challenge is that they are reluctant to give out loans uh, to uh, mostly to uh, uh, firms that need this fund for structural transformation because they believe that there is a challenge in getting their what uh, their payment back, and this is very big role that has to be quite uh, quite addressed. Hello? Hello, Professor. And also, uh, there's a need, for example, now, when we had the COVID-19, there's a need to address the major disruption in the financial market because of rising risk due to uncertainties that uh, we now have from uh, uh, COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic constitutes an uh, unprecedented global macroeconomic shock of certain magnitude and duration 
as the pandemic continues, so now we are going to the second wave of the pandemic now. Non-financial corporates face increasing funding shortfalls as cash flows from operations diminish or dry up. Demand for bank credits, including via existing credit lines, tapped by corporates, has increased materially and is likely to remain elevated uh, in the short term. At the same time, tightening credit supply, especially in the non-bank sector, could significantly add to fund strains in the corporate sector. Therefore, credit spreads have widening sharply for riskier borrowers, including those who borrow from leverage loan and high bond yield markets, high yield bond markets, and those operating in sectors particularly impacted by the pandemic. The pandemic and the containment measures that have followed it are affecting both the supply and demand side in the highly interconnected global economy. The world now is a global village. So both the supply side and then the demand side are actually facing the challenges of the, uh, of the pandemic. Our pressures on the supply of credit to the real economy have been a major concern. Nobody's willing to lend to the firm, not to industrial firms. Nobody's willing to lend to agricultural firms now because of the of the pandemic. The financial system actually is more resilient and better placed to sustain financing to the real economy as a result of salary regulatory reforms in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And after we had the financial crisis, a lot of uh, activities were actually put in place. In the case of Nigeria, there was what to call bank consolidation in which the capital base of banks were actually increased. You can imagine if the capital base of the banks have actually not been increased. This have, would have actually uh, affected a lot of economy. And these reforms across the continent have improved the resilience of the core of the financial system. Large banks are better capitalized, less leveraged, and hold more liquidity, and have remained resilient through this market uh, stress. Over-the-counter derivatives, markets are simpler and more transparent. The use of central clearing has increased and collateralization is more widespread. Non-bank financial intermediation, MBFIA has grown, diversifying sources of, uh, of capital. Those aspects of non-bank financial intermediation and intermediaries that contributed to the 2008 financial crisis, including certain form of structural finance, have declined and posed significantly lower financial stability uh, risk. However, financial intermediaries and market face growing challenges in lending and uh, funding. Bank and non-bank financial providers have to cope with rising credit risks. Credit quality will deteriorate as the global economy enters a recession, affecting corporate bonds with an already high share of low investment grade or high yield ratings. Bank and non-bank financing providers have to cope with rising credit risks. Credit quality will deteriorate as the global enter economy enters a recession, affecting recovery bonds to a ratio of low investment grade or high yield ratings. Credit rating agencies have started downgrading corporates, pushing some of them into high yield segment and have revised their outlook for other firms to negative with potential procyclical effects. At the same time, growing risk aversion and heightened demand for cash, including to meet increasing margin costs on derivatives position, has led investors to shift toward cash and cash-like securities. Given the fact that the value of most securities are going down, investors are now shifting grounds into cash and cash-like securities. Alongside this, a reduction in intermediation caused some markets to jump illiquidity, jump to illiquidity, including those that are normally considered as a high liquid. Some emerging market economies have also seen very large capital outflows. A preference for liquidity and safety appears to be reflected in significant outflows from investment funds that invest in less liquid fixed income assets, such as corporate and emerging market bond funds, 
corporate bond exchange traded funds, ETFs, and loan funds. Some large corporates have increased their cash holdings, which may have contributed to strains in funding markets. These strains can impair the ability of some part of the system of market-based finance from serving the real uh, economy. Now, operating financial firms in contingency mode may add to vulnerabilities. Precautionary lockdown measures are testing the contingency plans of financial institutions, market infrastructures, and market participants. Remote and split site working and limited staff availability may challenge the execution of complex market operations and centralized functions. That is, for example, market making less effective and loan origination may therefore be impeded. Disruption to telecoms or third party service providers will also affect uh, financial institutions. Given the challenges, you know, everybody is now in the digitalized uh, model of uh, service delivery now. And the resilience of key nodes uh, in the global financial system is therefore critical for financial stability. Several of these nodes have gained importance in the aftermath of the global financial crisis that is almost coming down to the current pandemic situation. Now, the ability of financial institution and market to channel funds to the real sector of the economy. Resilience built over the past decade has allowed the banking sector to meet demand from corporate drawing down on existing lines. Number two, the ability of market participants around the world to obtain US dollar funding, particularly in emerging market economies. Number three, the ability of financial intermediaries, such as certain investment funds, to effectively manage liquidity risk. Number four, the ability of market participants to manage effectively evolving counterparty credit risk. COVID-19 related development have resulted in modest volatility in repo markets, thanks in large part to the swift action taken by central banks. And the surge in volumes cleared in central counterparties along with increased margin calls. Now, what are the potential policies that are needed to enable the financial market to recover faster? Having itemized and highlighted the issues that are actually that have caused uh, the markets to move in different directions by COVID-19. The policy measures taken by institutions have bolstered resilience in the four critical nodes. Measures to support the provision of credit to non-financial corporates. Authorities have adopted a range of measures to support bank lending to those affected, in particular SMEs. One set of measures includes direct fiscal support and government guarantee schemes. Jurisdictions have also put in place public guarantee schemes to incentivize bank lending, including to SMEs, as well as direct fiscal measures, including deferrals of tax uh, obligations. Number two, another set of measures uh, that have been adopted to actually try to um, uh, to mitigate, uh, uh, to enable the financial market to recover faster, uh, is the, and that includes measures to provide regulatory flexibility or other macro prudential supports. Some jurisdictions have reduced some countercyclical buffers and provided waivers with respect to capital requirements. Firms have been encouraged to make full use of flexibility embedded in existing regulation and to use their capital and liquidity buffers as they lend to affected households and businesses. Some authorities have recommended that banks do not pay dividends and do not buy back shares 
for a given time period so that to reduce the effect on the um, the, on the financial markets. Central banks have also, have also taken a series of measures to provide liquidity to banks and markets, including through additional longer term refinancing operation or a reduction of minimum reserve requirements. There are measures by central banks to alleviate US dollar funding shortages. Certain steps have been taken by the central banks to reduce round tripping and ensure dollar availability for investors that may actually need it. Measures too have been taken to alleviate funding constraints from the shift of investors to save assets. Some central banks have established a money market liquidity facilities to provide liquidity to market intermediaries purchasing assets. Term asset backed security loan facility, a primary dealer credit uh, facility. The international standard setting bodies have themselves taken steps to address the financial and supervisory implications of COVID 19. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervisions, BCBS, extended by one year the implementation timeline of the outstanding Basel three standards, namely the standards finalized in December 2017 and accompanying transitional agreements for the output floor, the revised market risk framework, and revised pillar three disclosure requirements. BCBS and the International Organization of Securities Commission extended by one year the deadline for compressing the final two implementation fees of the margin requirement for non centrally cleared derivatives. BCBS published technical clarifications to ensure that banks reflect the risk reducing effects of exceptional measures by government and banks when calculating their regulatory capital requirements. So I want you to ponder a bunch of set of questions uh, that are being given in the Microsoft Word document, this which is which has been given to you. You will see some motivating questions, you see some discussion questions, and you see some case study questions. I want you to try your hands on them before you finally go over and try your hand on the multiple choice questions. But in the context of this particular lecture that uh, has just been delivered, I want you to reflect on the institutional arrangement for mobilizing domestic resources in your country. Do you think there is adequate transparency and accountability with the process of mobilizing domestic resources in your country? And I want you to select a revenue collection agency maybe custom, maybe uh, uh, tax authority, and evaluate the strategy of resource mobilization. Do you think there are lessons for African economies to learn from high growth developing countries, given the kind of institutional arrangements that they are putting in place? Country like La Malaysia, like Thailand, like Indonesia, South Korea. Let's take a look at them and look at their institutional arrangements. Do you think there are lessons that African countries can actually learn from this? Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'll be getting across to you in due course as we go along in the course. Thank you.